Professor of Planning and Civil Engineering at the University. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have you here tonight uh, to tell you a little bit about the background of, of why we are all here tonight. Uh, for the last five or six years now, the University of Waterloo has partnered with Concordia University and McGill in Canada, and together <coughs> with colleagues from the uh, University of Cal the College of University of Applied Sciences in Karlsruhe, Germany. I was going to try it in German, but I thought, I'll say Hoshuma. That's from all of my German. So I'm done now. Uh, wait, I can say Ein Bier as well. So, so this, this is my German. Um, and so we've been partnering for the last five years, and we've been having an ongoing exchange. And so some of my students have had the good fortune of being hosted at uh, Karlsruhe, and some of uh, Karlsruhe students have come. Now this is the second visit for Karlsruhe students to Waterloo. And so for this week, we are together. There are 10 German students. There are about 10 Canadian students, uh, three from Montreal, seven from here in Waterloo. And they are working in teams together looking at rapid transit stations. So we are looking at the University of Waterloo station. We are looking at the Uptown Waterloo station and also the Victoria Street Transit Hub. And we are trying to do some design work, some integration around pedestrian, cyclists, conventional transit, and rapid transit. Uh, we hope to come up with some very good ideas, but we hope not to send you back to the environmental assessment process again. But, so we're not turning the apple cart completely upside down, although there may be some very good ideas that, uh, that we can consider. So we are trying to exchange best practices. And in that theme, uh, we have our presentation tonight. And I should mention that our whole exchange is sponsored by two very good colleagues and corporate partners with both the University of Waterloo and the region of Waterloo. I'd like to recognize the WSP group. Anyone from WSP here tonight? Okay, and also the Parsons Breaker Hawk. These are two consultants who are working with the region of Waterloo on their LIT design, and they are the financial sponsors for our exchange this week, and we're very grateful to them for their support. Our speaker tonight is Holger Wagensommer. Holger has uh, been working in the transit industry now for about two decades. He holds an undergraduate degree in civil engineering, and also uh, the German model for a master's degree, as some of you may know, is called a diploma. It is an extra year at the end of your undergraduate time where you earn a master's degree in really a project-based uh, approach. And so Holger also has a diploma in civil engineering. Uh, he began his career as a research assistant at the university. I should say he studied at the College University of Applied Science. Uh, he stayed three years there after his diploma working as a research assistant with a professional, with a faculty colleague, after which he became a consultant for Mylander Engineering Consulting. He worked there for about 10 years doing infrastructure planning and engineering. At that time, he left and became a project engineer for uh, BBK, which is one of the design companies operating transit for the city of Karlsruhe. And for those of you who don't know, we'll hear more about it tonight. But Karlsruhe is a city of almost exactly the same size as Kitchener and Waterloo, almost exactly the same population, almost the same population density. Where we are building our first 19 kilometers, they are operating 290 kilometers. And they are also operating their light rail vehicles on German railway for another 310 kilometers, so 600 kilometers total. So we have some things to learn and we have some way to go. Uh, but we are excited to exchange ideas. So for the last seven years, uh, six years, Olga has been working for, for the, the transit agency. He is uh, now lecturing at the Hochschule, also teaching uh, transit and civil engineering there. He's also the author of the book called Light Rail Systems in Germany, one of the many authors of this book. And so there is no question about his expertise. This is uh, <laughs> what we like to refer to as the Bible. Every morning, the, all of the light rail operators come and they place their hands on this book in good faith and do this work. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, Holger Dagenson. Welcome, welcome. Turn the lights down a little bit on the on the screen. Let me see. Maybe you just want to get and I will make a mess of the way. Thank you, Chef, for the warm welcome and the warm welcome. In water. It's my first time in Canada, and so it's my first time in water. Oh, 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 So, um, I will start 
first take a look at light rail system in general in Germany and after that little presentation I will switch to the get practice and examples from my hometown from Karlsruhe uh, where we see some special effects we have. Um, mobility, everybody knows, I hope, is a, is a key element of modern societies and ensuring mobility is indispensable. Germany today has some of the most attractive and modern library system. This setting an example of best practice, perhaps on a global space. At the end of the presentation, I hope you will notice that Germany is not only World Championship in soccer. We are, also, we are also very good in public transport. So. Could be very similar to metros, but these all means light rail. So 
library can fit persons up 20,000 or up, up to 100,000. It depends on the drags, it depends on the amount of cars you use. So you have to, before planning, take a look at the passengers you have on bus now or library, and so you can design. In rectives, there are mixed forms. So it's not clearly defined between category one and category two. So we have category two in Karlsruhe. No, that's not. We do. In Karlsruhe, for example, we have 300,000 inhabitants, which is close to category one. And on the other hand, our rolling stock is 2.65 meter wide and offers space for 230 people. This is category two. But the platform length is 75 meters, and these facts on the right hand is category two, and on the other hand is category one. So don't be shy to put it, the mixed forms together and say, oh, if it's category one or if it's category two, that doesn't matter. But in the book, it's very hard to find. <laughs> <coughs> to, to use the term light rail, this is often used fluidly in Germany. Some transport companies own or cities describe their modern site tramway as light rail system, even though their design profiles indicate that there are nothing of the kind. Some cities whose light rail networks include substantial underground sections refer to their system as metros, even though they do not match the definition of a metro system. So the confusion is perfect, especially on the international level. In legal terms, both light rail and metro system fall under the umbrella category of tramways, meaning they are subject to the guideline contained in both PDFG passenger transport aid in Germany and the associated law, BioStrat, that means Betriebs of Straßenbahn, Ordinance and the Construction and Operation of Germany. The key distinction between light rail and metro is that light rail is integrated into the existing tramway system, so any new built route, sections or network components can enter into service as soon as they are complete. So what we use in Germany. In Germany, also ensuring that the public has an adequate public transport is part of a government responsibility. To provide such basic public services is Article 1 of the regional law, regional regionalization. Local transport means Germany. If in the majority of cases where a mode of transport carries passengers, the total distance traveled is maximum of 50 kilometers or one hour to drive. And light rail transport doesn't count as regional rail transport. So light rail is not standardized. It's just advanced tramway, the use of the term light rail has become customary for referring to more advanced trams, which are largely separated from the other traffic. It's very important because so you can travel by your own speed and don't be on being stopped by cars. Stop on a traffic, on a traffic junction, so we had also to stop. So on your own way, necessary. So be separated from the other traffic and have modern guidance, safety, and dispatching system. That's like right. the Public Transport Act set two four four obligations. 
obligation to operate, obligation to run on scheduled services, obligation to carry, everyone must be carried, and tariff obligation. So, before boring you with directives, acts, and other things from the legal side, let's say at last, the operator has to meet a whole series of obligations, these four, in return for receiving authorization to, con to convey passengers on public transport and derive income from such activities. In principle, light rail networks can be built underground, at ground level, or on elevated tracks. When light rail was just beginning to take off in the 70s, there was a clear trend towards underground. In 2014, tunnel-based solutions in Germany are falling out of political favor, and the trend is heading towards ground-level solutions. Why? There are two key reasons. Building tunnels is complicated and expensive. Later we will see that we build a big tunnel in Karlsruhe. <laughs> so, um, that was also a political decision. And local people are generally, in Germany, I don't know how it is in Canada, are opposed to major works. Stuttgart 21, Stuttgart 21 is a uh, later. <laughs> Also, most of the tunnels in Germany cities have already been built, and current projects are often in outlying areas like to extending existing lines. The number of people in urban areas is still rising, like here in Waterloo. If you see the slide here and the colors, Red means that people get out from this region and get to the region where it's blue or white. It's just between 3% is dark violet and 3% plus on rising population and minus 3% is red. German towns and cities are currently under construction. So in Germany, more than 200 km light rail and tramway track have entered into service since the year 2000. But before light rail networks can be built or expanded, the traffic flows in the relevant urban areas must be analyzed and projected into the future in the type, intensity, <coughs> direction, and distribution over time. So, before building, analyze. For the environmental protection, you can do a lot of things. 
here some samples. You can install a green track to reduce noise pollution. You can put LED lights on the shelter to, the, to save energy. For the switch heating, you may use geothermal energy and switch heating is especially for the winter time in Canada. I think it's, it will be very important. The energy storage system brings energy back into the network when the vehicles operate. And of course, park in right places, park in right stations for the passengers to get comfortable and on short distance to the PT system. Tomorrow morning we're talking about electric bikes and power stations on the bike ride station. That's all the number three. The light rail stops, the platforms are also very, very important. Due to the technical interdependencies between them, light rail vehicles and infrastructure must always form a single coordinated system. Attractiveness and performance of the LRT system are influenced by the quality of stop and vehicle entrance and exit. So the platform height is very important. If you get easy in and easy out, you save time at the stop. And the saving time makes your time schedule safe. So you run always on the time. The pictures shows you a tramway in Erfurt, German city. So take a look there. Who designed this one for me? A little steel shelter with glasses on the roof and on the back side. This is for blind people orientation system. The contrast between light, bright, concrete and dark have to be big enough. And so some things you can integrate into the city. Light rail stops must always blend with the building structure to the surrounding area. Stations I talk about for a station are on the same level as the vehicles, boarding and aligning is easy. Very special thing. We had 
both of them. And both system, and we put it together on that picture. You see the French, TG, TG, uh, the train more test, um, driving forward to the central station in Chicago. This is one of our LRT. Okay, TG is much more faster. And so it's in front. But what, what the picture will show you, it shows you that with a perfect vehicle and a perfect system, we can also run on heavy rail tracks and on light rail tracks. And now we take a picture and we take some slides from the dual mode system in Castle. Trading cards. We have trains and we have trams. We put it all together. This is one of the square downtown cards that you see on the slide. We have three different companies. All of them are public. These three. The KBV is the Transport Association. This association was the transport by the different companies. Different companies are could be this two, one or other companies. The main transportation companies in this area are these two. ABG, beyond the city center, and in the surroundings of Karlsruhe, and BBK, VBK, are in the city. Karlsruhe, some of the people are in the other board. Um, in the heart of Europe, is was built in 1750. Next year we will celebrate 300 years birthday, and all the roads are going directly to the castle. This is the castle, and all the roads go there directly to the street. Yeah, Baroque town, Baroque art. Castle is situated in the southwest of Germany. It is surrounded by the River Rhine <coughs> and the Black Forest in the south. And two famous people and inventors were born in Karlsruhe, not me. Um, <laughs> Karl Benz, the man who built the first car 125 years ago, and Karl Friedrich Reis, the inventor of the bicycle. Yes, two. <coughs> Famous sons of us. And now we are also very successfully but in the field of transport, especially in public transport. Let's take a look what means Karlsruhe model and what means public transport to Karlsruhe. And how does it change our behavior? But first we take a look on the sovereign level for PT. The cities are responsible for the public transport. They determine the quality of the public transport, timetable quality, level of fare, but also they have to pay for it. But there are two important exceptions. Exception one, the regional train service in the county of Baden Wimberg, and the exception two, the greater Stuttgart area in the capital of Baden Wimberg. The city area. So if you had to pay for the public transport, if you had to pay the companies to make them the public, public transport, so you had to earn money. And the money you earn, you get from the tickets. That's the only way. You don't earn much more money than from the tickets. We have no public transport company in Germany, and I'm sure in Europe, are making 
black numbers. That's fact. It depends on your system how high, how much percent you earn. In Karlsruhe we have 85 percent. That's very high. For German, the average is 70 percent. And the missing 50 <coughs> coming in by taxes and by the government to give you the money back that you miss. On the civil summary level, we have these different districts, cities, they are associated partners in the Verbund and the Verbund is the administration level and the administration level is coordinating and ordering the service by the transport companies private bus companies and by the federal transport companies and the ticket money is getting in is divided to that different companies later so everyone get the money he need. <laughs> the main job of the Verbund, the KBV, is the organization of information, standards, fair, marketing. These important things for a civil engineer is not important. Um, but the people driving with the transport system, the most important thing. Information, 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 information. Why is my train late? When will come the next train? And please, if you're thinking about information, don't put the information table on the roof of the shelter. And when you look at it, this time you can read the next train will come in two minutes or three minutes. So that must be correct. Not, do not lie to them. <laughs> <laughs> Next time they won't drive with you. So, BBK, for Casper to be a remember, they're just doing a job in the city. Tramway, buses. 1,200 employees, I'm one of them. And 128 trams, that one, 45 buses, seven lines, one suburban lines, and that's one of the transport company I'm working for, and the other one is the ABG, the Alta Verkehrs Gesellschaft, the pioneer of the tram train, and yeah? that's where we're doing. Um, this is a very special um, picture that shows you three trains are covered together, so the length is 115 meters, and it is not allowed to drive the three covered trains in the city. It's just allowed to drive two covered trains, maximum length, 75 meters. Sometimes we need three trains covered together because we have a lot of passengers to transport. And <coughs> so some of them had to stay on the platform and wait for another train. Sorry. Why? There was a call for action to invent the cars. What was it? During peak hours, traffic flow, traffic flow was like stand still. Everybody knows that. Congestion was a great strain for economy and environment, and traffic volume could not only be managed by private cars. It could be managed by the government, by the city by a lot of people who are thinking about what is good for the city and what is bad for the environment. Good public transport is a real location on the ground which we will see later. Our experience is that passengers accept up to one interchange. And it is much more easier to get people from cars into the trains 
instead into the buses. Because sitting in the bus is the same as sitting in the car. We also stay in the chair if you don't have an extra bus. Now. So it's important that you have your tracks, your trams on your on their own tracks. Travelers prefer to go by front trains. And they do not like to interchange. Maximum one interchange. Our commuters in Castle can travel from rural villages in the region, 30 kilometers or more away from the city, directly into downtown in 35 minutes. That's the time. But you need also by car. In the regions, our train drives up to 100 kilometers per hour, downtown, naturally less. And because of the same gauge of the track, it's possible to drive with our night rail from the city into the region. We use the existing rail infrastructure and we connect tram and train networks. The power is is important. If interchange is necessary, integrated timetables with trains and buses are very important. In addition to the integrated timetables, we usually do the interchange between trains on the same platform. And also we drive on the same platform between buses and trains. Every meter you save makes the system more attractive. Everything, really. If you can get out of the train and just make three steps on the other side of the platform and get into the bus or into the next train, that makes that makes public transport attractive. Not walk 200 meters or 400 meters to the next station. Perhaps a wheelchair. You know what I'm talking about. We calculated for the catchment area 1,000 to 1,500 diameter between two stops. Also, also we have a high timetable from one o'clock in the night and that's also public transport every hour. But only it's modern rolling stock is very important, climatization and of course an integrated fare system for all transport routes. Technical challenge was very important. You remember the legal framework, tramway guideline, heavy rail guideline, sorry, and the tramway guideline. And what our dual mode vehicle is able to do is they can travel on these heavy rails by that guideline, and they can travel on these tracks by that. That was a great challenge because the dual mode vehicle is now we have in three cities in Germany this type of vehicle. That's one of these. 37 meters long, 2.65 meters wide, 100 kilometers. And that's what I'm talking to you about the power supply. 50,000 kilovolt AC, that's what they had the power on the wire on German Railway. And in the city, we have 750 volt diamond current. And the vehicle does notice both. Drum and train were merged with the dual mode wheel. Most of our cars, our trains are driving in double traction, two trains are coming together, so you see that three slides before. Um, but normally, this is an exception here, the blue one. So this train was especially designed for the new line to Hyperkin, 65 kilometers eastward. <coughs> and it was from the American pop art artist James Ritzy in the year 2002. Pictures here, um, Ritzy died in 2002. Perhaps the 
the technical side is known by some of the listeners, but um, again, the dual mode beacon is able to change from 50,000 volt alternate current to 750 volt direct current by itself. <coughs> the driver don't have to push a button or anything else or put this switch off or on. The vehicle does it do on its own. Just see if you look over the shoulder of the driver on this middle of the lights. 750 watt in the city and they go to the change point as zero volt. 200 meters without any energy, just batteries on the car that the lights are on, and then change to 50,000 volt. So, <coughs> what happened if the train will stop in this section? Every passenger has had to really get out and. <laughs> no. Actually, not. Um, this section is on a little kneeling, 4%, 3%, so we rode back in the section. <coughs> this is where we have this system change over here, near the station door, and near the center station, and near the river right. Three points we can change from DC to DC and back. Uh, after this presentation, I show you a little movie where we drive through a section and you will notice nothing. You can take a look at the movie and just say, okay, that's very boring. Um, <laughs> but the, the people from the gray side visiting cars through sometimes they are on my side and show you show them the system. Like Show Jeff many years ago um, it was very impressive. They took a look at the roof. And there are two wires there. No, it's just one wire and a, a little part, 100 meters between without. So the technical side is now it's normal. It's much more heavy to to manage the legal side. Let's take a look on the network development. What's happened? These blue lines are 750 volt direct current. What do you mean? Uh, direct current. Okay. <coughs> and the red line there, that was our first line by the dual mode system. In 1992, we have 140 kilometers. 1996, we have 250. That's another dual mode line to Baden Baden. In 2000, we have 360 kilometers. We're going westwards to Stuttgart, the capital, by one. Not on our own tracks. We're just using the tracks from German Railway. And we for the years. That's normal. In 2005, it was 530 kilometers. <coughs> In 2011, it's now 690 kilometers. We are working on that track. And we are not ready. Now it's much more lanes with our Stadtbahn, with our Nightwest system. Than Former system with trackers. To the first line we opened in 1992. We, we started from the inner city in Karlsruhe up to the little town back. That was 30 kilometers away. And here you see one of our dual mode meeting in front of the city church, the marketplace in Karlsruhe. And I will show you how we drive to it back before 1992. The trains going from the central station direct to the next station, and now these are little villages where the trains are driving 
This was a German railway track. The marketplace is here, the university is here, and the pedestrian zone where all the shops are is here. This is downtown. After 1992, you see that you're driving from the central station <coughs> through downtown, university, pedestrian zone, towards Brecht. And all the passengers from Brecht, which will come to Karlsruhe, they drive through downtown. And that's what they want to go to. They don't want to go to central station. Why? They want to buy things in the pedestrian zone. They want to go to university. <coughs> this was the situation before. And after a few days, we have 8,000 passengers a day, then 2,000 passengers the week before. The main reason for the people to drive with our lightning was that the train stops downtown. Also downtown in time. We intensivate <coughs> So you see that people form of living here had a long way to the station. Now it is about 600 meters radius, like that. So they can reach every station. <coughs> So we just use the tracks and build new station there. Because of the acceleration of the trains, we can drive it on the same timetable as the trains by German railway before. Just because braking and accelerate very fast. And that's what we are this very interesting. The early development, the city of Berlin. minutes to the station and can use the track. The grey area is a sedimented area in 1992 before Schadbaum has driven to Brecht and up to 2004. There are new sediments, areas founded, the orange areas and these areas are very close to the railway and to the stores. The blue areas are additional sediment areas which are planned. Our target groups Special commuters, people who live in Brecht and going to work to Karlsruhe, but also in the other direction. I told you, from 2,000 passengers a day when we start, we have nine times more passengers, now it's more than ten times today. 80% of the passengers driving in the Stadtbahn with a dual load vehicle have their start in their destination point along the tram train lane and avoid any interchange. This is the green of the increase of passengers on the other lines we you see the 690 kilometers network and you see always passengers getting more and more and more. But these more and more get problems to us. It's sad for us. Sometimes that it's very successful, but um, <coughs> now we have a problem we have to solve. That's what we are talking about. I'm, I'm, on the one hand, I'm, I knew that we have to solve the problems in the traffic. And on the other hand, I see that we had to pay a lot of money to give them. We take a look. First, we had to take a look on the, our new generation, our new train generation. It's a uh, Flex City car by Bobotier, Canada. And now they are in, in use. We have 30 trains 
ordered in 2009 with the option for 45 or more. And the first trains arrived in autumn 2011. And the cost for one train is 4.3 million euros. That's 5 million million euros. It's just su such expensive because of the dual mode. Without conflict of duty 
utilization of labor traffic as well. So development potential, the inner city is rising and we hope when we are ready our inner city downtown is much more nice because we don't have such a big amount of yellow wagons in there. Look in the future of how it looks. So, this is marketplace. This is in the underground. The systems are working, and I'll be sure the situation for the pedestrians will be much more better than for the shops. We started working in 2010. Now we have a big tunnel machine and. Started this weekend in Glasgow <coughs> and it will dig 10 meters per day. The glasses are shivering in the houses, I'm not sure. We will see. <laughs> That's very, very impressive. The costs are 800 million euros or more. And at last, may I answer your question? I will show you this picture. This is one of our trains in Switzerland. So this shows you that you can drive by the dual mode vehicle across the border to Switzerland, to Austria, to Italy, North Italy. Because the gorge is the same and the electricity is the same. And 